All right. On gallery view, um, speaker view. I think um, I think we, we should get started now. Um, and um, I want to welcome everybody to this um, event. I have a, a very short PowerPoint that just to show everyone what's going to happen this evening. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Does everyone see it? Great, looks good, thank you. Uh, you. Can you see it now or is it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So um, basically, um, okay, so basically the Town of Somerset Environment Committee has uh, created uh, the second uh, forum this evening for an hour. It's about leaf blowers. Um, I'm joined by most of the Environment Committee members, uh, all listed here on this front page. Myself as the chair, Jack Frank, Donna Harmon, Ralph Wooden, Dave Catan, Veronique Marier, and Anthony Bartley. Uh, that's our email if you want to send us any um, comments. Um, anyway, um, today's agenda will be uh, a quick recap of the uh, form number one. Um, hold on one second. I have to see somebody who wants to get in. So, um, okay. So, um, anyway, uh, recap of the form number one. Then there'll be a short presentation by myself for five minutes. Um, then I want. I will share the notes of uh, discussions with a few minority owned landscape companies um, that were willing to talk about it, but were, but were uncomfortable to join the Zoom meeting for uh, a couple of different reasons. Um, one of them just wasn't familiar with Zoom, and the other one didn't feel comfortable with their English. Um, and then we'll have our three speakers this evening giving five minute presentations. That will be Kelly O'Cleason from Groundsmith Collective. She has been hired by our town as a garden consultant, followed by Chris Colby, who is from Backyard Bounty. Um, and they have a, a lot of experience already with battery powered leaf blowers and other machines. And then John Shorb of Shorb Landscapers, who has, is doing presently a lot of uh, work in our neighborhood. And that will be followed by uh, Q&A, which is, will um, be the most of our time together. Um, so the recap of the EC forum um, on the 14th was that we had Jamie Banks of Quiet Communities. She spoke about the health hazards of these gas powered leaf blowers. She has an unbelievable wealth of information and scientific evidence that she shared with us. Followed by Chuck Elkins, who is our uh, DCANC commissioner, who spoke about the, the process by which Washington DC passed its legislation to ban leaf blowers. So we already have a city right next to us of 700,000 people who have um, signed on to this ban. And then more recently, um, uh, the town, the Chevy Chase Village did the same and piggybacked the same exact legislation. And Maria Hatziolos spoke about that. Um, Kelly spoke for just a, a little bit that last meeting and that's why I invited her back. Um, but the, uh, the bulk of information and science uh, I put on our Mother Earth Project slash ban leaf blowers, it has just been recently updated with even more scientific evidence because I'm also part of a group, a collective group of colleagues in the county that are trying to uh, ban leaf blowers in their own townships as well as um, in Earlridge. Uh, our county executive to do the same. And actually, uh, um, Mr. Ehrlich is, is actually wanting, wants to do that in Montgomery County. Um, so as just a reminder, the essential issue uh, of leaf blowers is that this is a public health issue. Um, that is not a disputable uh, item. This, the science has been in for years. Um, and as it turns out, most of the gas power leaf blowers exceeded, exceed the county noise limit of 70 dB. Uh, it's 50 feet. And this can cause permanent hearing damage. Um, I actually already know some landscapers that um, have 
if you could just mute yourself, Don, um, that would be great. Um, yep. Also, um, the reason why they use more powerful, uh, uh, louder machines is because the louder the machine is, the more powerful it can blow. So that's, that's the instinct to buy these illegal machines, um, is because they can blow harder. And I guess by virtue of that, they can do the job faster. Um, so that's why people are doing it. But since it's not being enforced by the county as a law already in place, people are just doing it more and more. And as it turns out, 85% um, of the 100 leaf blowers that were um, uh, sampled in the Chevy Chase Village, 85% of them were actually illegal. Um, again, this is a low frequency noise that penetrates great distances. Um, and also all these, most of these machines or all of these machines are two stroke machines that emit hydrocarbons, including benzene, which is a known carcinogenic. And uh, only, half, only a half mass respirator can protect the operator. Regular mass will not sufficiently protect an operator from this type of um, hydrocarbon carbon, in fact, it reminds me of the story which I just posted on the listserv that about 20 years ago, they passed a law to put the rubber um, uh, muzzle around the, uh, the, the fuel, um, the, gas, the gas pumps, uh, gas stations, because they were emitting fumes and they determined that the gasoline um, emits a, um, a dangerous fume, uh, which is carcinogenic, so that, that nozzle is now removes the fume. But, but unfortunately for the operators of these two stroke engines, they still are breathing not only the gasoline fumes regularly, but also these hydrocarbons. Um, just, uh, I said already this, um, the law is that anything over 70 dB at 50 feet is illegal. And that also two leaf blowers or more are not allowed to work together in tandem because that will make the sound louder than 70 dB. You know, if you put two noise, news source, noise sources together, um, that's what happens. Um, it gets louder. Um, I only have two more slides. Um, one is that um, our county executive, Mark Urich, he does support um, banning these gas leaf blowers and his staff at the Department of Environment Protection are working to draft a bill to um, to address this issue. So there's already a lot of movement um, at the county level. Um, who knows how long that will take, but I just want to let you know that. And also the Montgomery County has decided to have a go electric event this spring, whereby people can bring in their gas powered lawn equipment um, and get a receipt, which they could use towards an event where you could buy uh, battery powered and electric leaf blowers at wholesale prices. So that's a, uh, an exciting event coming up in the spring, more details to follow. And finally, the last, um, the last uh, slide is conversations with different landscapers, minority owned landscapers. And I did this, uh, some council members wanted to hear from them because of their concerns. Uh, this first one is from Enrique Cabrera, who is our foreman for the town. <laughs> and he called Kathan Kathan. Uh, Barbara Moranis, if you would be kind enough to mute yourself, that'd be great. Um, and I asked him a couple questions, and obviously it would have been great to have him on the call, but what is most important to you, safety or economics of your business? And Enrique uh, responded, definitely safety is first. I constantly tell my guys to wear eye protection and masks. Most landscapers are not using either of these. <clears throat> How long does the Ego battery powered leaf blower last? He said a half an hour. These are the ones that we just bought for the town. And then I asked, how long does it take to charge this battery? Another half an hour. So that's a good number. It, it's well balanced. So as one um, is charging, the other, the second battery is being used and it can be swapped back and forth. And how powerful is this uh, Ego 600? CFM leaf blower, the, the battery one, compared to your 70 dB 580 CM, CFM gas-powered uh, blower. Um, 
he said basically they are close in power, but he, he actually still feels that the gas power machine is a little bit stronger, um, which is sort of odd because it, it says here that the battery powered one is rated at 600, which is a larger number than the gas powered one at 580. So go figure. Um, would you plug your battery charger into your client's outlets, like outside their house? He said, uh, one client wasn't happy with me using their electricity, but I have since found out that plugging in this charger for one hour cost the client less than $1. So he said he probably would bring that information up. I mean, this is part of the education. Um, the, last, the last conversation I had was with uh, Jorge and Dro of <coughs> the World Lawn Service. This is actually my landscaper. Are you open to using battery powered leaf blowers? Sure, they are powerful, but not as powerful as the 74 um, gas powered ones. I have been doing your property for two years with an electric machine and it's fine. Would you consider using a plug-in leaf blower? Uh, that would be difficult to move the wire around. <coughs> Excuse me, the wire around. I prefer not. Um, are you concerned about the health hazards of, of the gas powered leaf blowers? Now that you have shared with me the ha actual hazards, it makes sense that we need to ban these machines. Will your business be able to survive without these gas powered machines? I think so, but there will be a transition and also clients need to be a part of the process. Um, so that's, that's the, um, <laughs> one up. Um, so that's, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I just wanted to follow up, you know, when I, uh, everybody, um, um, I just want to, um, the last one about, it's a transition and also the clients need to be part of the process. It reminds me of a listserv email from um, Josh Freeman who said that he, he really wished that people were not using their leaf blowers so regularly, like once or twice a week, all year long. It seems like they, everyone's using it more and more. So um, that's a part of, uh, you know, the behavior that we, as residents, that we need to uh, visit and, and reconsider. Um, with that, I'd like to pass um, the wand over to Kelly, and please share with, us your thoughts. Great, thanks Martin. Um, yeah, so the town has hired Groundsmith Collective as gardening and conservation landscaping consultants. We are working on a sustainable maintenance manual as well as conducting trainings for maintenance staff, uh, which is led by Enrique, who is an incredible professional. Um, so um, with that being said, I have a couple things I do wanna mention. Um, so I do appreciate the dialogue, Barton, that you've, you've had with the actual folks with the boots on the ground. I think that's essential. I think it's also really important to acknowledge that really this comes down to a class issue and um, you know, capitalism and efficiency and doing their job as fast as they can to make as much money as they can. And this is talking about the landscaping industry in general. Um, with the town, we have a lot more opportunity because they, they're, you know, working for the town and we're setting the, the design parameters. But as long as we acknowledge the fact that, you know, a lot of the environmental movement is led by a class of individuals who are highly educated, talking down to people who are actually doing the work um, and kind of moving away from that model, I think we'll have fantastic success. Um, so uh, with that being said, um, specifically uh, leaf blowers are used to clean up landscapes. So, um, you know, contractors will use them to clean up a job site after they've just done the installation or if they are hired to do the maintenance uh, for a garden. And really the two issues come up for leaf blowers um, in regards to leaves specifically, which Barton asked me to talk about. Um, so with our recommendations for the town, which are gonna to be outlined in our manual, um, there's the issue of grass health. So prioritizing um, areas in the town that uh, need to be maintained as lawn um, and uh, making sure that those areas are kept clear of leaves um, and or pulling the leaves to the lawn and mulching them with a, a, with a um, 
a push lawnmower and bag and bagging it and basically transferring those leaves into the landscape beds. Um, the cool thing is leaves are carbon and so is mulch. Uh, it's virtually the same, um, you know, in science. Um, so the compounds are the same. So basically we should be, whatever leaves the town has on town property should be utilized on town property. It's free organic material. Like it's silly not to, and we're going to be talking with Enrique and his crew about what that means, um, what it looks like. So that leads me into the aesthetic shift, right? Because like people are obsessed with mulch. This is something they see everywhere. People are really comfortable seeing it. They expect that's the norm. And so we're going to be working to make a, a really a paradigm shift in, a, in aesthetic expectations. So um, the look is a little bit different, but the nice thing is that um, mulch tends to fade in color just after just a few weeks. Um, that's why there's a whole cottage industry of dyed mulch, just because people want that fresh color. Um, but when you have leaf mulch, um, that color really stays uh, for quite some time. So we're going to be working with them to move towards a model of mulching the leaves with, uh, with mowers, turning them into fine particulate. Um, we're actually currently doing some research to find out how small the particulates need to be before we actually use them in the lawn because you have to be careful with putting uh, even, you know, leaf shapes, even if you mow the leaves and they are the size of a quarter, that can inhibit sunlight from reaching the grass blades. And again, like when we keep these nice lawn spaces, like the public spaces by the town hall, it's nice to have lawns. Like I've been out there many times and the community is using it. They should be if we're in a pandemic, like lawn has a very important purpose. So um, we're currently doing research to see how small of a particulate is, ne is, is needed to put it in the grass itself. So maybe it's a, you know, three times mow over the, the leaf pile to get it to that size. But, um, it's really exciting. It's really exciting to be able to share some of these ideas, um, cost savings, um, you know, building the soil within the town, moving away from mulch, which a lot of times is like chopped up, you know, wood pallets from, um, you know, shipping industries. So yeah, it's super cool. Um, we have a, you know, bilingual um, person on our staff, Yeni. She's going to be translating our entire document in Spanish. And uh, she's also going to be present at the uh, in-person maintenance training that we do with the staff. So. Um, that's pretty much what I have to say. Um, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this project. Thank you, Kelly. And you probably sure. will get some follow-up questions uh, after the other speakers. Um, of course, yeah. So, and also you, you remind me of uh, my own personal story, um, which, uh, which as I used to put a, a huge pile along the curve line of leaves and now we do, I do bring it all into the grass and we mow it. And my landscaper, uh, Jorge, says he needs to mow it three to four times for it to really uh, disappear. So Got it. it does take multiple times. And I think actually I already have, my next door neighbor said that uh, it was a real revelation to see what, 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 our, what our family is now doing with our leaves because they didn't ever think about it. It just, you know, education is just sort of, sometimes happens in nonlinear steps. But anyway. I guess the one last thing I do want to say, Barton, that you bring up is that there is a shift that's happening um, across the country from, you know, using gas powered equipment to, and, and chemicals, um, to a more manual system. And, you know, gas powered equipment and chemicals were really a result of capitalism, doing things efficiently, making money. So because we're having to dial back on those practices, um, in order to benefit the environment and the bay, which, you know, there's a whole waterman community, so many people rely on the bay and the bay health. Because of that, we are going to have to invest more in, like you said, Barton training. We're going to have to invest more in possibly hiring more staff. So, you know, if we're going to be doing things manually, you know, you have to have more time. It will take more time to do things. So as long as everybody is aware of that need, everything will work out great. But those realistic conversations need to be had. And um, I think we're all on the same page, so cool. Great, great. I'm gonna now pass uh, over the conversation to Chris Colby from Backyard Bounty. Go ahead, Chris. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for letting us take part in this. Um, you know, the first thing is uh, we would certainly not want to get rid of our leaf blowers. <laughs> as, you know, as was mentioned before, you know, they really are an integral part of how we do business. That said, we transitioned over to 100% battery powered uh, all of our equipment about three, four years ago. And it was, um, it was definitely an investment on the front end, right? You know, it, 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 it took a fair amount of investment and in time and money and training to get over to the battery power pieces. But there have been a couple things that have come out of it in the long run. The first one is, you know, for the folks on our crew, you know, they are not having to deal with these incredibly loud noises. They don't have to deal with smelling gasoline uh, with um, dealing with, uh, you know, the tools that they've got going on. You just kind of plug in the batteries and you go. Um, so it's actually good for the crews and they acknowledge that. Um, it's good for the clients. I had uh, a client in Somerset, as a matter of fact, tell me a couple of years ago, you know, I don't even know when your guys are here, right? Because they come for maintenance and they use the blowers and I don't even know that they've actually been here. Um, it is good for, um, it's good for us because it's actually a lot easier. Once we get down the system for recharging the batteries and we actually have not had any clients, um, I don't know, challenge probably isn't the right word, but all of our clients have been perfectly happy to let us charge our batteries while we're on site. So what we do is we show up, uh, we plug in our batteries, we go about doing our business, and then we take our batteries and we leave, and it actually keeps the batteries going all day long. We haven't had, um, what do they call that with electric cars, range anxiety, right? <laughs> we actually haven't had that with our equipment because we can keep these things charged all day long as they go, as they go through. Um, on the downside, um, you know, it did take a fair amount of training with the guys on our crew to get them used to the fact that, you know, we were going to be using electric stuff. They also, as has been mentioned before, have a perception that the electrics uh, equipment is less powerful than the gas stuff that they've been using for 20 plus years previously. So we're still working on that. For most of the way we work, you know, we're not blowing 25 foot long piles of leaves along. We're cleaning up individual job sites. And so we haven't had any issues with it at all. Um, the other thing that we've been experiencing, and we're going to be looking into this over the winter, is, um, you know, some of the blowers that we've been using, we've been having durability issues with them, to be honest. Right. So that's something that we're going to be looking into over this winter is how do we make sure that we're using the right equipment. But the, the funniest thing that I heard was, um, I can't remember if I saw this in the paper or where recently, but there's been a, an outpouring of concern about gas leaf blowers lately in a lot of suburban and urban communities because folks are home. Right. And it used to be that you would go off to your office and the landscaper would come through with their leaf blowers and you'd never hear them. And now that folks are having to listen to gas powered leaf blowers, now they're like, oh, my heavens, this is absolutely awful. And I don't want to listen to it anymore. I know that I've gotten to the point, you know, after having used this electric equipment for three years now, that when I hear a gas powered leaf blower, it just actually, you know, sets the sets the hair on the back of my neck on fire. So we have been, you know, we've been really happy with the transition over to the electric equipment. Uh, we're going to continue to do so. And, uh, you know, certainly can, we'll do whatever we can to support helping others get over to that, uh, get over that hump. That's great. Chris, thank you so much for that short presentation. And I'm sure you're going to have also some, a lot of follow-up questions shortly. All right, our last speaker before we open it up to Q&A is John Shorb, um, who is of Shorb Landscapers. John, uh, you have the mic. Can you hear me? Uh, He's muted. Yeah, I see that. Ask, um, Uh, let's see. 
You can ask him to unmute, Barton. I did okay. do that. Um, let's see. Ask to unmute. Um, let's see. Unmute audio. I don't see him. Okay. Um, okay, so I think at this point, since John is struggling with his um, his Zoom connection, they were just going to open it up to questions. And I'd like to ask and invite maybe the town council members um, to uh, ask questions first. And then as their questions die down, we can open it up to the rest of the residents. Um, so I'd like to go to that. And then when John Shore is able to um, connect up, we'll, we'll, we'll bring him in for his presentation. But please open, whoever wants to speak, uh, please go ahead. Chris, um, this is Marty Shaw, how are you? I'm, uh, my question is, you mentioned that there was a fair amount of upfront cost when you transition from the gas powered to the electric. Can you give us any sense of the scale of, of the investment that your company needed to make? Yeah, you bet. Um, it's basically about $500 per blower. Uh, not surprisingly, the vast majority of that cost is in batteries. And as I think Barton had mentioned before, you know, uh, the, the town went with two batteries per blower, which is the right way to do it. Uh, the downside of that is, you know, the batteries is what really costs the money, right? Um, so, you know, $500 per blower, about the same for mowers, the trimmers are a little less expensive. So, it, I mean, it was, it, it was thousands of dollars. You know, it, it was, I mean, you know, for a little tiny company like ours, it was, it was a really significant expense. And, and, you know, Edamarie and I and the rest of the team spent a lot of time thinking about whether or not we wanted to make this switch. And, um, and it was definitely a leap for us. But um, you also must be saving some money on gasoline as well. Uh, potentially, sure. But to be honest, that's not something that's going to... No. That, that's not going to be material, right? Um, you know, especially compared with the fact that I don't, you know, it's much more important that my guys don't have to, you know, I'll bet you I've saved a lot more on, um, uh, what's the word I want, uh, you know, the noise canceling headphones that they would have had to use with the gas powered ones than I, than I would have saved on gas. So. And just to add on to what um, Chris did say, my, my uh, landscaper recently bought a 74 dB um, gas powered leaf blower a couple months ago um, without realizing that it was going to be illegal. And he said that that cost $450 for that machine. There you so go. The very loud machines are more expensive because they're more powerful. Um, so that, um, anyway, uh, just add that, but go ahead. Yeah. So just one follow up question. So you said that you were going to be looking at the duration of the equipment. Does anybody have an idea about how long um, the gas powered blowers last relative to the electric, the battery powered ones? That's a really good question, Marnie. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know, uh, you know, and, and just to be perfectly transparent about this, right? I do know that we have struggled on occasion with some of the battery powered blowers. You know, they have broken down sooner than we would have wanted. And it's like, you know, like if, if your microwave breaks down and you want to get it fixed, the, you know, the, the number one answer you're going to receive from somebody is just replace it. And the second answer is, <coughs> if you want to get this thing fixed, that's fine, but it's going to be 120 days turnaround time, right? And for us to be without a piece of equipment for 120 days is, is definitely a hurdle. It really is. I just one other question. What's uh, your experience been with the life of the battery packs? You know, ironically, the batteries were the thing I was most worried about, and they're, they're the things that we've had the least problems with. Uh, we, we have not had, you know, I'll bet you we have, 
probably 20, 25 batteries all told between all the crews and all the trucks. And I've had maybe two batteries fail. Um, you know, and, and when they fail, they go into complete cardiac arrest, right? <laughs> you know, they, they just die and they ain't coming back. But, uh, but, but yeah, we've only had a couple actual batteries fail. It, it's been the actual equipment that just won't turn on, right? And again, like, an, like a microwave, like everything else we have, when it stops working, it just stops working and you're not going to tinker with it. I was going to quickly mention that I think it's important to really understand the costs of all of the operations that the maintenance and landscape staff do. I think I don't currently know how much money is spent on bags of mulch. I don't know how much money is spent, you know, on um, uh, compost and, and whatnot. And so I think that there is opportunity in shifting practices to, you know, reclaim some of those resources that can be then um, utilized in other areas, such as having additional um, battery leaf blowers on hand, you know, having at least an extra few just in case something happens. You know, Kelly, that's a real good point because, you know, we have been trying to work with our clients on what we're calling a leave the leaves program, right? And, and, and that has been, that's, that's certainly been a process. Uh, we would love, um, you know, we like to leave the leaves, especially this time of year, right? Um, and we would love to get to a point where we're actually also spending less money on compost applications, less money on uh, mulch applications in the spring. I mean, that's, that's definitely the long-term goal. That's good for everybody. Yeah, and the fact that, you know, we're talking about specifically, you know, town-owned land and also broadly the residents within the town and learning about the shift I mean, you all do have quite a bit of influence on, on what happens and what are the policies and procedures are. So this is not like convincing 800 residents to only use, well, I guess unless we are, I mean, Barton, are we trying to um, eliminate gas blowers townwide? Uh, yes, we put forward uh, legislation to consider for the town council to consider to ban the gas power leaf blowers. Gotcha, um, okay. And I'd like to interrupt this small conversation because now I do have John uh, Shore connected. Uh, John, can you please go ahead with your presentation? Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yay, thank you. Um, sorry that, uh, so my, my thoughts on the blowers. So first question, Barton, have you found any contractors who are pro gas powered blower who are against a ban? Um, not personally, no. All right. The reason I, I think we're all preaching the choir here on this issue, which isn't a bad thing. Um, so my, my opinion of the blowers are, are two things. I wouldn't ban blowers altogether. I think the backpack, the gas powered backpack, gas powered backpack blowers are the issue. The noise, the pollution and the overuse because they're easy to use, because a crew leader, a crew member can grab a backpack blower, run away from the crew boss and blow leaves and nobody's gonna bother him. It's that convenience of the backpack that enables laborers to abuse them, to put them on full blast, chase around one or two leaves and not do the hard work, bending over, picking weed, et cetera, et cetera. So during the regular growing season, Taking putting the fall aside, we're we've been trying to pull those things off of our trucks and give the guys either smaller blowers to just blow down the paved surfaces or electric battery powered ones. We've had we've been trying. I think Steel is the brand we're using, and they're like two thousand dollars a piece, and they're great. They'll last about three four hours. We got an extra set of batteries so the guys can get through a full day with them during the regular season. When you get to the leaf season, during the fall, it would seem to me the wheel powered blowers that are on you know, the heavy things, that are big engines, lower decibels, the pitch doesn't cut through the windows and bother people as much. There is a good place to use those things. I mean, there's a proper place and they will not be abused. Um, this human behavior because they're heavy and unwieldy, the guys don't want to use them as much as they want to use the backpack blowers. So I would just suggest that you make a differentiation between the wheel blowers with a different engine, different pitch, 
compared to backpack ones. And with backpack ones, I would simply suggest that you consider if they're battery powered versus gas powered. Because again, I think the focus should be the gas powered backpack blowers. We found that even though our sales team, our consultants advocate that to our clients and our prospective clients, that a garden shouldn't be sterilized like an operating room. Um, and a lot of clients, potential clients say, oh yeah, no, that makes sense, that makes sense. Only for us to get complaints later on, you guys didn't blow the leaves, what's the matter with you? Can't you do that? I'm like, well, we can, we chose not to. Um, Barton, I think I shared an email with you of a client who was just ballistic because he had a little bit of leaf litter at his house. Two days after a big rain with five huge poplar trees in front. Um, so there is an expectation from some clients um, that the garden should be sterilized. And, and Kelly, I, I commend your efforts. That you know, it's a re-education of the clients that is really going to be probably the most effective and sustainable way of of moving this this ball along. Just getting a paradigm shift on on how gardens should look. Um, but again, I think one needs to be careful on putting our values on other people. So mm -hmm. we've seen guys, my guys included, abuse backpack blowers, um, spending an incredible amount of time just chasing one or two leads. And that it, it is the problem. So I'm with you guys on this. Um, I hope that if there is a ban, that it is enforced equitably, unlike the fertilizer laws and unlike the pesticide laws, you will lose a lot of credibility if it is being selectively enforced. Um, we're seeing that with Maryland Department of the Environment, um, Maryland Department of the Agriculture and DC Department of the Environment. When there's no enforcement on the weekends, when the unlicensed contractors are out doing the work, undercutting us, and quote, outperforming us, that's a problem. Um, so I would, I would urge you guys to, to, to look at even enforcement, big company, small company, white company, minority company, whatever. We're all doing the same work. The rules need to be enforced equitably. Right. Yeah, and I remember John, I've had multiple conversations. Thank you, John, for your presentation. And you obviously will get more follow up. But yeah, John was talking about the complexity of working with different clients with different expectations and and Kelly has mentioned that and so is Chris about that this this process is not just about banning gas powered leaf blowers uh, by the way that's what this is about not all leaf blowers uh, the battery pack we want we just it's the gas powered ones that we're considering banning um, but the, there's a, there's a huge education that needs to be um, um, continued to uh, educate uh, the residents about all these issues that have been brought up. Please go ahead with your questions. Um, hey, Barton, I was also going to mention part of our contract is was not only to do an educational session with the staff, but also to open it up to the community at large. Um, we have been trying to negotiate what that looks like because of COVID. I'm a very touchy feely, like in person kind of professional. Um, Seeing it and feeling it gets the message across a lot better, but that is part of our contract. So we absolutely will make sure we address this um, when that workshop occurs. I hope it's not digital. Maybe we'll do both digital and person. I don't know, but we'll figure that out probably in the spring, early spring. Of the yeah. I, I saw Steve Serco raise his hand. All right, Steve. Uh, hi there. Th thanks. So thanks to everyone. Thanks, Barton, for setting this up and to all of the uh, the guest speakers. I guess I, I was curious to hear a little bit more about the interaction between landscapers and lawn professionals and residents. Now, I was sort of encouraged to hear about some willingness to let uh, landscapers plug in to recharge their batteries at their house. Um, I'm just curious. Is, has there been difficult dialogues? Has that been straightforward? Have there been other issues with residents that folks have experienced? Well, John Shorp here, we, we've never had any issues with that. We have extra, we're, we're not plugging into people's homes. We got a longer battery 
life and, and double batteries per, per crew. Um, so it has been an issue with us. Chris, how about you? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, we do plug into clients' uh, outlets when we're on site and I have not had any issues with it whatsoever. Most folks have been like, hey, we're just happy you're using battery stuff, have at it. I'm hoping to get to the point when we can get electric trucks where I can just plug my trucks into their outlets, but that might be a little bit of ways. <laughs> Um, Ron, thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate that people are bothered by the noise. I'm bothered by it also. But I've also heard talk about how much these cost for each of the, the speakers tonight. And Chris, you mentioned that your business is, is a small business. But just from looking at your website, you're probably a lot bigger than some of the guys who are running their businesses off their cell phones and don't even have the resources that you do. Um, you know, and I know some people have talked about mowing and raking, and that's perfectly fine, but I appreciate some people may not want to do that. What I find interesting about this is that this, everyone seems to be focused on a ban, and yet what's interesting is this is kind of a classic economics problem with a classic textbook solution. Pollution, including noise pollution, is a negative externality, yep. and, the, and the answer is to tax it. And it seems that one approach might be for the town to require the landscapers who want to use this equipment to pay a fee for a permit. And it could be based on the number of homes that they serve, maybe a fee for if you're serving three to nine homes, another if you're serving 10 to 20, another if you're serving more than that. Those people who want it can pay for the privilege and putting this price in there might alter the economics so that people will be more encouraged as the batteries get better and the equipment gets better and comes down in cost to make that transition on their own. Two other ideas is that the town code limits gardening with noisy equipment, I think from seven to seven or 8 p.m. and nine to five on weekends. You could narrow the time frame for this type of equipment so that it isn't blasting all day long, but at least people can use this if they need it, but it, it's not gonna be a, a consistent dim. You know, the last point, which goes to something that John mentioned is that Blowers are used year round, but most of the year they're probably used just to clean grass clippings off of walkways and stuff. I can imagine allowing the blowers to only be the, the gas power blowers to only be used when their power is most needed during the fall and there are a lot of leaves out there. And you know, at other times, even an elect, even a plug-in blower, um, which isn't going to be as powerful, is probably still useful for getting the you know the low when you don't need as much power to move leaves but you're just moving grass clippings i'm not suggesting those are the right answers but at least it seems like it's somewhere in between uh a, you know an outright ban and it, it actually does have the convenience of not of being like literally the textbook solution if we all pull out our econ books from freshman year college uh, thank you for your question um does anyone want to answer that uh I'd like to make some comments, but if someone um, speaks with one, say something. So I, I have one one comment to that. There, uh, you know, periodically, a few of my employees will leave and start their own businesses, which I fully support. I usually have an exit interview with them, and strongly advocate that if they're going to start a business, that they have to be street legal. You have to get your if you're going to apply fertilizers, you need your fertilizer license. You need to have your pesticide applicators license. You need to have your DOT license. You need to be OSHA compliant. You need to do your payroll taxes. You need to do your workman's compensation. Nine out of 10 of the times they say, too expensive, I'm gonna take the risk. So if you do, because they are expensive to obtain those permits or those licenses or those permissions, that, you know, creates a problem if you try to tax something and if they just decide I'm not going to register, therefore you can't tax me. So now you're back to the enforcement mechanism. I love the idea, tax a pollutant, but the devil's in the details on implementation. A good point. Thank you for that, John. And it, Ralph, I'll let you speak in one second. I just want to, you know, I think the carbon pricing idea is a major, um, is a major, 
uh, and very successfully implemented idea now in Canada and other countries around the world for reducing um, fossil fuel emissions. Um, but you know, I just want to re remind everyone that this is this is a a real health hazard, not just about uh, trying to reduce noise, but also we have pollutants in our own neighborhood. But go ahead, Ralph. Well, yeah, I appreciate that, but uh, you know, the town actually is not legally supposed to be regulating the pollutants. The, the noise is okay. But I, I used to do this for a living in government and. Right. It, EPA regulates these and other government entities are not allowed to regulate these for well, reasons the that EPA does. The but the noise, the noise can, I agree, no problem. The noise is a health hazard, uh, not just, but go ahead, Ralph. Okay, I, I'd just like to speak to, to several of those points. Um, it's not like we just sort of are this island and, and we came up with this idea, hey, let's ban the leaf blowers. Um, Washington, D.C., 700,000 people, they are banning leaf blowers starting January 2022. Uh, Chevy Chase Village, I believe, has decided to do it. All the Chevy Chases, the uh, town of Chevy Chase and, and many of the municipalities in our area are going to do this. Montgomery County is considering doing this, and they'll be more likely to do it the more of the smaller municipalities who do. Um, the whole idea about charging people extra, well, golly, you charge them extra, they're going to get a better job, and uh, they'll pay the extra. They'll pay for the noise. Uh, do it during certain hours, and you'll get more leaf blowers during those hours. Um, there, we, we can't chip away at this. We're doing it because it's the right thing. It's, it makes less pollution. The noise is unsafe not only for the workers, but for us, for the neighbors. Uh, the, my next door neighbor might you know, pay the extra money and have three leaf blowers working at once. The noise doesn't stop at, at the border. It, it carries over into my yard, into my house. Um, we're trying to do this for all of our town and, and in fact, for everyone who lives in this area, not only our town. Um, we're piggybacking on DC who has done the work and made the choice and many others are doing it. We just can't compromise and, and, and water it down. I mean, like Ralph said, go ahead, Julie. Julie, you have to unmute yourself. Can you? you um, did you want to finish your statement before? I just was just a reminder. Uh, that actually Chris Colby from Bracker Bounty said it was a, a large initial investment and the way he spoke about it was meaning it looked like it was a, like a, a non-linear moment in time where he decided to do everything all at once. Whereas, um, you know, my minority owned landscaper who I've been using for 30 years is a very small business, but he bought a $450 gas powered leaf blower uh, as opposed to a $500 one, just because he didn't know, and he doesn't know the risks of, uh, 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 of his machine. But what you could do is, I mean, the whole idea is we're doing this ban to start in one year's time. So you, you graduate towards this period. You don't just have to put out thousands of dollars at this one moment in time, but you, you buy your machines. I mean, he said himself that his gas powered leaf blowers only last about two years time. Um, before they they conk out, so you spread the you spread the expense out. So you, it's not a one. Um, go ahead, Julie. Well, actually, I, I want to address um, two issues that I think, if if I have read the arguments of opponents of this, you know, an, enough. I I think they the most of the arguments against revolve around two issues. One is this cost, as if it's going to be borne by these, you know, small businesses, especially immigrant uh, landscapers. And then the second issue is the issue of compliance. And our, our neighbors are, are they are going to be, are they going to be at each other's throats because they have to, um, they're enforcing this. Um, so the first issue to me is a red herring issue. These businesses are not going to bear the cost. If they bear the cost, 
it's because they are afraid of raising their rates. And we are the ones who are then forcing them to subsidize their services to us. If we're so concerned about them bearing the cost, we just pay more. And this is not a community that is struggling. If you are paying a landscaper in one of the houses in this neighborhood, you can pay more. If that is your concern, it's sort of a misplaced charitable impulse as if you know they can't price their services at what it is worth. If they pay more, if this does involve more expense, fine. They charge you more, you pay more. They're not bearing the burden. The second issue though about the compliance, I think it is a time limited problem because um, this is going to spread. It is going to become a, a, a regulation that is enforced in more and more parts of our county. And at that point, compliance is gonna be a non-issue because there will be no way that a non-compliant landscaper is going to be going around doing business around this county. But I really, I do believe that we have to come up as proponents of, of this. Um, the proponents of this have to be able to answer the question of what does a small town without a lot of administrative capacity do in the interim until that time when it passes the county, we're surrounded by, or, and, and even the county takes over enforcement, what are we doing? And I, maybe I've missed the answer to that, but I don't hear the answer. And I don't want to be having to uh, enforce this myself, really. You know, even though I very much support it, I don't want to have to enforce it. So I, I really think this requires, a, you know, the, I, I, I'm really happy the Environment Committee is pushing this, and I, I hope the Town Council considers it very seriously. But I do really, I do want to hear sort of more details about, even if it's just for a year or two, um, it, it's not going to go into effect for a while, but then what if the first year or two it's, we are sort of surrounded by non, you know, air, land that is not under the same regulation, the county has not done it. What, what, how do we make sure that the very first non-compliant uh, leaf blower that is used in Somerset, something happens and who's going to do it? Um, before I let somebody answer that question, I just want to, it's a great question, uh, Julie. I just want to uh, fill in some more of what you just said, but the first thing is when I did ask my landscaper to stop blowing the leaves to the street and put them in a big pile so he picked up, uh, the first thing I asked him is, listen, I'm not sure, I've not done this before, you haven't done this before, so please um, keep track of your hours and let me know if the price is going to change for this job, and if so, please charge me for the job and, ha and, and the added extent, expense, um, which he has done. And it is almost the same, but it is slightly more. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing I wanted to just say, which is a um, uh, speaking to, with a conversation I had with John Shore, uh, he told me that one of the reasons why he has started to change to electric uh, blowers is the fact that he has a number of clients already He's had some, he has clients in DC, so he's already uh, anticipating the need to do that. And that's what's happening. Landscapers that have clients in DC are already making this change. And, and as Julie said, as more municipalities start to ban them, then the landscapers are going to be, uh, as John has already uh, spoken about to me, are already making this natural transition. Yeah. Yeah, hey guys, this is Chris from Back Bounty. And, the, and that's a really good point because if you think about it, there are two things that a landscaping company is going to be most responsive to, right? Number one is efficiency. You know, John and Kelly and myself and everybody else, we don't want to manage two different sets of equipment, right? Because we don't want to, you know, every morning, seven o'clock, we load up our trucks and we don't want to say, okay, here's the gas blowers for this neighborhood and the electric blowers for that neighborhood. The other thing that we really are responsive to is what our clients want, right? So when our clients say, hey, I'd really like it if you could use electric equipment, we're going to respond to that. 
it is important to remember that we're also going to respond to clients who I, I think it was John who mentioned this, who say, you know, hey, why the heck are there still leaves on my driveway, right? You know, we're really going to be responsive to both efficiency and what our clients want. At the end of the day, those are the things that really matter. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I, I saw, um, Franny, I'm going to let you go in a second because I saw uh, Steve before that he wanted, he wanted to answer that question about the citation and the um, enforcement. So <coughs> speak after, um, please. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Martin. Um, two things. First off, I'd like to, um, before I talk about compliance, I'd just like to talk about something that's been raised by, that, that, that strikes me um, from our various speakers, really about what, what Kelly raised about capitalism. So I think it's very interesting that the two different uh, landscaper uh, companies that we've had speak this evening have have come to have adopted different um, solutions for electric powered leaf blowers. I think it just shows the range of possibilities out there and the fact that different companies making different business decisions for different clients um, can come to different solutions. And there are a range of solutions out there that can work for different people. Um, going to the compliance question, great question, Julie. And I'm not sure that we have the complete answer, but I think I can tackle it a little bit or at least give my perspective on it. Um, first, I think it's important to recognize that we are currently in a situation of non-compliance with the law. As studies have demonstrated with um, say Chevy Chase Village, a majority of the gas powered leaf blowers in operation are illegal. They are producing too much noise. That means that the residents are suffering hearing damage. The only question is whether that hearing damage or is temporary or permanent and that depends and, and the factors there are going to be individual factors and the length of time of the noise damage. But it is not a good situation. It's a situation that should be avoided. That's why there is a county law that establishes uh, noise limits, and these noise limits are being exceeded. Um, and one reason why compliance is so difficult is because it is, frankly, very inconvenient to figure out what the decibel levels are of any particular piece of equipment at any particular at a particular uh, distance from that piece of equipment, um, but it is much simpler to just say gas power leaf blowers as a class operate too loudly, penetrate too far, so let's just ban them. And once gas power leaf blowers are banned, it becomes a much simpler compliance issue for the town and the town town of Somerset already has in our town code uh, restrictions on uh, construction noise. Our town lawyers recommended a language or, or developed language that just adds this as another line in that section. And we would use the same compliance mechanisms to address uh, leaf blowers as we do to address construction noise. And that's not to say that the town of Somerset does a perfect job addressing construction noise but we have a mechanism, we have a process, and we can improve it as we move forward. Yeah. So those are my thoughts. And if there are any of the other council members on the line that all want to chime in, uh, that'd be great. All right, uh, let's go to Franny. Thanks, Barton. Um, I had a question that I um, originally wanted to direct to Kelly. Um, I sort of appreciated her framing at the beginning of her presentation about um, holding some concern for viewing um, this through, um, try, trying not to affect people um, in, in a class way. I, I'm not stating it as elegant, elegantly as she did, but uh, this ties into my concerns about the enforcement. And, um, you know, I, I remember when we were talking about opting into the county's rules on pesticides which was a program which was already in existence and people had already mapped out, you know, the education and enforcement aspects of it. And the county representatives, I remember Barton, you, you were part of that 
or maybe you organize that. Um, but you know, the, the county representatives were very clear that their strong emphasis was going to be on education and that they were sort of, they were not going out with an intention of finding people or, you know, putting anybody out of business and so on. And, uh, and frankly, that was one of the things that made me um, comfortable with going along with opting in for the town. And one of the concerns I have here is that because there isn't a county law in existence, because we're creating our own program, we can't, you know, rely on Chevy Chase Village to come and enforce for us or, you know, DC or anything like that. This would be us on our own. And, um, and I do have, I do share some of the concerns that some people have voiced in the community about enforcement and who would bear the cost, if any, if somebody is fined. And I understand, um, I thought Julie made a great point about, you know, sort of baking in the cost of new equipment into um, higher fees. And I do hope that some established landscapers will do that, but I do also worry that some of the smaller businesses may feel like they're going to, um, that they don't have the flexibility to do that, to raise their prices. So these things concern me a lot. Um, I guess what I want to ask Kelly specifically is whether she sees any kind of um, sort of best case scenario for how to enforce something like this in the town of Somerset with what you know about the town of Somerset specifically. And before you answer Kelly, I just wanted to say that we're now uh, at like 836. So we've already gone about an hour. We started about five or 10 minutes late because people join in late. So I think it's okay if we go on another five, five more minutes, um, if that's okay with everybody. Um, I see Kathy wants to ask a question too. So go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, I, I think an edu educational campaign is essential. Um, I think as we can all acknowledge the political climate right now and division on opinions of, of politics can translate to division in aesthetic, you know, intentions and who wants whose yard to look like what. And I think I think to really get at it, you need, you know, good science, you need very kind and thoughtful pamphlets, you need a very kind and thoughtful and bilingual campaign, you know, um, I think that'll go a long way. Um, I think it's essential because I, I, I don't live in the town, but I can't imagine any resident wanting to police other residents. I think that could get really ugly. Um, but that's up for you guys to decide. But in terms of like the educational component, I mean, you can easily do hold workshops. My firm would love to do uh, workshops with residents and show methods and um, mm -hmm. do teachings uh, virtually in person, um, you know, and, and handing out and uh, putting mailers in the mailbox, you know, um, that's the piece I think would be very effective. Well, specifically, I wanted to know whether you thought that the residents should be fined or whether the landscapers should be fined. Oh, good point. Um, well, goodness. Okay, so all I can say is that I did have an, inter an interaction with one resident who I was walking with when I was in the town surveying, who asked me if I knew somebody, a landscaper that could come just do a little cleanup and she didn't want to spend a lot of money. So I think at the root of all this that, you know, people don't want to spend a lot of money on their landscape. Um, that's just a fact. And like I brought up capitalism because, you know, the entry gate to landscaping is really not that difficult. You know, if you can operate, you know, simple machinery, you can get a business up and running pretty quickly. Now you get into like tree care and all that, it gets pretty risky because of the risk of human health. But the entry to starting a business is really not, is really low. And a lot of people have, you know, started businesses because of that. So yeah, that's kind of a, an ethical issue that I think the town probably needs to address is, you know, do you want you know, if, if residents want to pay for cheaper services, they probably are going to have non-compliant landscaping companies. You know, I think that's just a fact. I mean, I was asked myself, I'm a landscape architect, and I was asked if I could do her landscaping for her. I said, I'm not going to hire, you know, she was looking for a deal. Um, yeah. People are always looking for deals, you know, so I don't know how you enforce that. That's like, again, an economic issue. You know, the town clearly, you know, is in an economic bracket that I think could, like, Julie said, can really think about how can residents cover the cost to benefit the environment and do some, you know, um, social good in that way. I think you guys might have to meet, you know, go halfway before this becomes a universal practice in the area. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, Kelly, I, I see that we have, why don't we just limit our, uh, our, our Zoom call for two more questions, one from Kathy Picard and the other one from Robin Barr, since he hadn't, hasn't spoken yet, but go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I just wanna, personally, I think the resident should be fine. I've had the same, same landscaper for decades and I'm not about to let that guy lose business. I mean, I personally will make sure I pay him more, whatever it takes. But recently, I, he and I sat down because I told him I really needed to talk. <laughs> and I think it scared him. And I said, you know, we're going to have to change because he's used the gas leaf blower for, for a long time. And I didn't want to upset him. So I went into such detail and explaining and blah, blah, blah. And then he said, oh, you mean you want me to just do what I do in Chevy Chase Village at this point? And I said, well, yeah. Uh, sure, what do you do in Chevy Chase Village? He said, well, they have the sound, you know, we can't violate the sound. So he said, I have equipment I use just for them. And so he's, that's what he did. For now, he switched to that. Now we're going into, I'm going to buy, I'm going to purchase him, a, you know, a battery powered system to use on my property. And he experimented around last week with mowing and he's mowing the leaves and they were a little too thick but we're adjusting it but he's very willing to be educated on this and wants to be educated on this so i um i didn't need to go into all the explanation that i i did it remind me a little bit of when my six-year-old asked me what virgin meant and i went to such detail to explain what it was and then i said why do you ask and she said because paul newman's virgin salad dressing <laughs> <You know? laughs> It was a little bit like what I did. <laughs> I did that with our landscaper. But anyway, I have a lot of faith in educating. And then if it does come down to enforcement, I think it should be on the property owner, not the company. Yeah. Anyway, I'll thank leave it. You, that. Thank you, Kathy, for your comment. And um, I think we're going to finish with Robin uh, with his, his question, comment. Yeah, it's more a comment and it's just that I've heard the term leaf litter and I wish we would get rid of that comment, uh, that particular term. Uh, empty candy wrappers are litter and cigarette butts are litter and plastic bags breathe blowing in the wind are litter. Leaves are a resource and we need to learn how to use that resource. And that's the education that's most needed, which is the residents need to know about what the resource is that is in their yard. I'll just finish with this observation. We're going to have about one and a half, two inches of rain fall at the weekend again. The leaves that are on the ground are going to do a wonderful job in retaining a lot of the storm water that comes down there. The leaves that have been swept away uh, will do no use whatsoever. That's it. Hmm. Okay. Well, listen, everybody. I want to thank everybody for your comments. I thought it was a very constructive um, and illuminating conversation. And um, I'm going to post this as a recording uh, on the town website for those that didn't see it today. And um, as a lot of people have already said, let the, um, the conversation continue. Thanks for your time this evening. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you thank all you. very much for coming.